Old school wrestling fans will remember Nelson Fraser Jr, better known as Mabel, as the personification of everything wrong with 1995 WWF. Fans of the Attitude Era will remember Nelson Fraser Jr as Viscera, a member of the Ministry of Darkness and later as the world's largest love machine. Either way, Nelson is an example of a failed push in the WWE. It's also since been reported that he wasn't the safest guy to work with either, but more on this later in the video. Nelson was born on Valentine's Day, ironically enough, in 1971 in North Carolina. As a little bit of side trivia, Nelson is the first wrestler born in the 1970s to ever compete at a WrestleMania, doing so at the age of 23 at WrestleMania 10. He was trained by Gene Anderson of the Minnesota Wrecking Crew tag team. Anderson was also responsible for training the legs of Ken Shamrock. Men on a Mission were Anderson's last ever students. Nelson began his pro career at the age of 21, teaming up with his storyline brother Bobby to form the heel tag team The Harlem Knights. The Harlem Knights were a heel tag team that competed in the USWA and PWF. In the same year as their USWA debut, they would be signed by the WWF. Nelson and Bobby would become Mabel and Mo. They would also get a rapping manager named Oscar and they would also gain a new name. The team would now be known as Men on a Mission. Men on a Mission were introduced by vignettes airing on WWF TV shows. They were portrayed as inner city, working class African American men who wanted to make positive changes in rough neighbourhoods. Vince McMahon thought the team would work better as baby faces in comparison to their heel work in the USWA, so the Harlem Knights had a complete gimmick makeover. Say what you will, but when Men on a Mission made their debut and began working matches, they were incredibly over with fans and arenas, always receiving a good pop. Of course, this likely wouldn't work in today's WWE climate, but for all the flack that the team takes nowadays, especially Mabel, the team got the desired reaction from crowds. Oscar's rapping during entrances, coupled with Men on a Mission's bright coloured ring gear and the sheer size of Mabel, made the team an instant hit. After working a Survivor Series match in 1993 alongside the Bushwhackers, the team would go on to feud with the Quebecers in 1994. During a house show in London, England, Men on a Mission faced the Quebecers for the WWF Tag Team Championships. Men on a Mission won the belts when Pierre forgot to kick out of a pin attempt as scripted. The blunder was fixed just two days later though at another house show in Sheffield, England. In saying that, the title changes were reported on American WWF shows at the time. This is just an example of how a botch has inadvertently helped get something over. Men on a Mission would turn heel after attacking the Smoking Guns after a defeat in 1995. What's interesting about this though is that Oscar, Men on a Mission's manager, actually left the company after the heel turn as he felt that the team was really making a positive change to inner city ghettos and he felt that turning the team into heel thugs was nothing he wanted to be a part of. Oscar explained that the reason why he signed on to be part of Men on a Mission was that he was a positive person and believed in the nature of the characters. He would retire from wrestling completely after the heel turn. Mabel went into singles competition and this is when the infamous decline occurred. He was booked as a major heel and he would be soon going up against the biggest and best baby faces that WWF had to offer. The first stop was the King of the Ring in 1995. While it was clear that Vince McMahon had plans to push Mabel potentially as a top heel, no one expected that the former man on a mission would win a tournament that also included the likes of the Heartbreak Kid Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. But Mabel did indeed win the tournament and the King of the Ring crown. Mabel defeated The Undertaker in the quarterfinals and got a bye into the finals as the Shawn vs Kama match went to a draw. In the final, Mabel defeated Savio Vega. 
King of the Ring 1995 was a poor show. We had seen Savio Vega work four matches in one night and he had only been in the company for around a month at the time. He was a replacement for an injured Razor Ramon, so things were never going to play out how it was originally intended. The show dragged on, and seeing Mabel win at the end gave more groans and sighs of relief that the whole ordeal was finally over. WWE would learn their lessons and, going forward, they would only feature the semi-finals and the finals during future King of the Ring pay-per-view shows. So King Mabel was born, along with his former tag team partner Mo being repackaged as Sir Mo. As a small side note, Reggie Parks made a King of the Ring belt which was given to Mabel after winning the tournament, but it was never seen on WWF TV. The WWF wasted little time getting Mabel prepared for the main event and, at the second In Your House pay-per-view, Mabel was one of the 30 lumberjacks in a main event featuring Diesel vs Sid. Mabel attacked Diesel on the outside during the match, kick-starting their feud that would lead to a title match at SummerSlam 1995. SummerSlam 1995 wasn't a bad show. The problem was that Diesel vs King Mabel had to follow Razor Ramon vs Shawn Michaels in a ladder rematch. Shawn and Razor would be revisiting their WrestleMania 10 classic, which should have really gone on last. Instead, we were treated to a Diesel vs Mabel main event, and it was bad. Really bad. For what it's worth though, Mabel said later that both he and Diesel were lobbying to Vince McMahon for Razor and Shawn to go on last, but Vince was having none of it. Think of the most generic match featuring two big guys trying to do some lighter moves and multiply the boredom by 10 and you pretty much have Mabel vs Diesel from Summerslam in 1995. Champion Diesel had a sore back going into the match and he specifically asked Mabel to go easy on his lower back. In particular, Diesel didn't want to take Mabel's sit down splash. Mabel done it anyway and further aggravated the injury to Nash. Kevin Nash said, he had already hurt one of the Samoans. He went through about six to eight guys that he hurt, and when you hurt a Samoan, you're like, okay, fuck this, shut the ride down, it's over. I told him, don't fucking do that to me, referring to the sit down splash, and he fucking did it. I could barely feel my legs. I thought the guy paralyzed me. They were going to fire him on the spot. Vince was about to give him his papers right there, but I said if you fire him, you fire me. He made a mistake, let's make sure it doesn't happen again. Mabel said about the match, We had a spot or two in there that didn't go as planned. I felt it would have been better if I was the champion and let Diesel chase the title. That would have solidified my legacy. But Vince wanted Diesel to kill the monster, and that's what happened. The 1995 SummerSlam match would have obviously gotten Mabel in the heat with the click, which we all know is the kiss of death back in 1995 WWF. Sir Mo also had problems with Shawn Michaels. As the story goes, HBK was angry that Mabel left the show early due to sickness. For whatever reason, Shawn took out his frustrations on Mo and struck him from behind. Mo said if Shawn ever puts his hands on him again, he'd give him a receipt. Keep in mind, this is all Mo's words. Apparently Sean spoke with Vince McMahon and Sir Mo was nowhere to be seen on WWF TV for a lot of months. Apparently the situation left Mo feeling depressed and suicidal and it took the likes of Randy Savage and Davy Boy Smith to pull him out of that mindset. Again, this is all Mo's words. Take from it what you will. Check out the Two Man Power Trip of Wrestling's YouTube video all about the incident. Things would go from bad to worse for Mabel. After the Diesel debacle, he was booked to feud with The Undertaker, and again he would legitimately injure another top star. Mabel was to hit a series of leg drops on The Undertaker during a beatdown, and somehow Mabel managed to fracture Taker's orbital bone when delivering the leg drops, which put Taker out of action for two months. The writing was now on the wall for Nelson Frazier. This was the second time he had hurt a WWF main eventer. He would stay around long enough for Undertaker to get his revenge in a casket match at In Your House 5, get buried by Diesel in an 8 second match on Raw, lose again to Undertaker in a casket rematch on an episode of WWF Superstars, and then be the third wrestler eliminated from the 1996 Royal Rumble 
before making his departure in the WWE. Mabel would return to the USWA, work in the Puerto Rico based World Wrestling Council and also have a one night appearance in ECW before returning to the WWF. He made a one night appearance on July 6th 1998 in a match against Ken Shamrock but would make his full time return in early 1999. Now one does have to wonder in question, if Nelson was so prone to injuring superstars why was he brought back into the big leagues and allowed to work matches again? This is something we can't really answer. Either the stories were extremely exaggerated or, more than likely, Vince was willing to give Nelson another chance after a good long prep talk. Mabel was kidnapped by the Ministry of Darkness during the Royal Rumble match in 1999 and was reintroduced as Viscera the following night on Raw. He worked as an enforcer for the Ministry of Darkness and completely altered his look to fit in with the new gimmick. Throughout the year, Viscera was mainly used to get top baby faces over and his time in the ring was more limited. When the ministry broke up, Viscera became a mid-carder in the WWF. He would be used in the Hardcore division where he won the Hardcore belt for all of 2 minutes during the WrestleMania 2000 Hardcore Battle Royal. After a brief feud with Mark Henry, Viscera was released from his WWF contract in August of 2000. He had a few years on the indie scene before making two short appearances in TNA. Viscera would then be rehired by the WWF and keep employment from 2004 to 2008. He was reintroduced by JBL who was having a feud with The Undertaker at the time and eventually Viscera was moved to B shows such as Sunday Night Heat. Viscera would soon be repackaged as the world's largest love machine, turning face and pulling himself out of the B-shows for a little while. His gimmick now was all about seducing women and not so much about winning gold. In 2007, Viscera was repackaged once again, this time as Big Daddy V. He was sent to the WWE's version of ECW and was used again to get other people over. I really do wish there was more to talk about here with Viscera's later runs in the WWE but there is nothing remarkable going on. He would frequently lose matches and the run was entirely predictable. The only thing of note was he did become the number one contender to the ECW championship but lost due to disqualification in a match against CM Punk. He wrestled his last WWE match on March 11th 2008, losing again to CM Punk. He was drafted to Smackdown in 2008 but never worked a match on the brand. Viscera would then again find himself in the independent circuit and also found some work in All Japan Pro Wrestling where he worked as Big Daddy Voodoo. His last match was a win over Ronnie Dupree in October 2013. While full details aren't completely known surrounding Nelson's death, it's been reported that on February 18th 2014, Fraser had gone into his bathroom to take a shower and then he began to get chest pains. An ambulance was called to the scene but the wrestler had already just suffered a massive heart attack. He died at only 43 years old. His death certificate stated that morbid obesity and heart damage due to type 2 diabetes, a common complication of obesity, were responsible for his heart attack. In addition, drugs and alcohol were present in his bloodstream at the time of his death. Nelson Fraser Jr. was cremated. His ashes were distributed between 500 pendant necklaces which were given to friends and family. One year after his passing, Nelson's wife filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the WWE. In the lawsuit, Nelson's wife states that the WWE had concealed information, misrepresented research and misinformed her late husband on the risks in wrestling relating to concussions and CTE. She says that due to Nelson's work in the WWE, her husband was left with depression, migraines and short term memory loss, all of which contributed to his death. Like many others featured in these videos on my channel, Nelson's wife was represented by Kairos Law. Check out my Doink video for more information but in short, Kairos Law represents around 60 wrestlers past and present, alive and dead, in suing the WWE for concussion based injuries. 
The lawsuit was eventually dismissed in court, with the judge ruling that there was no evidence that showed Nelson's death was related to CTE. WWE attorney Jerry McDevitt said, It's ridiculous that someone can try to blame someone else because a gentleman with a weight problem died of a heart attack in the shower eight years after he last performed. <laughs>